My name is Roar Sundergaard. Uh, I'm from DTU Energy uh, in Denmark. Uh, I'm in the solar cell group headed by Professor Christian Krebs. Uh, we're a group of about 35 people and we do most of our research within OPV based on roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing, but also we do a lot of work within stability, uh, characterization and chemistry. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the upscalings we've been doing uh, at DTU. Um, and first of all, everybody has a clear idea of solar cells. Uh, and the reason why the scientist thinks it's a really interesting idea is uh, the amount of energy um, that's available. Uh, and I think this picture represents this very well. You see uh, our um, down here, the yearly uh, energy use uh, from the whole world, and you see that the sun is by far uh, the largest capacity uh, we have. So why do we want to work with the organic solar cell? Um, well, if we go back to the original idea behind the organic solar cell, it's the prospect of having a very, very low cost that has driven the research. Um, the low cost comes from the possibilities of solution processing, uh, which allows for manufacturing methods using roll-to-roll -roll processing, uh, which opens up the possibility to do flexible uh, solar cells of really large areas using low temperature, um, which again, um, gives a very low embodied energy in the final solar cell. And because of the material selection of polymers, uh, this becomes very, very, very big. The possibilities are almost endless. Some of the issues with the organic solar cells uh, today is still the lifetime of the solar cell and also the efficiency. So, just uh, very briefly, how does an organic solar cell work? It's a, a multi-layer structure. Well, we have several different layers, uh, ranging from a few nanometers up to four, 500 nanometers. Uh, in the middle, we have the active layer that is the absorber. And this is surrounded by uh, charge selective layers, which will allow either positive or negative charge to uh, to pass, and finally we have the electrodes, um, one of which needs to be transparent in order for the light to uh, pass through the substrate. Uh, the actual material itself in the organic soil itself is often composed of two materials, a donor material and an acceptor material. We take two uh, very typically used uh, materials here, a fullerene and a P3HT polymer, what will happen when we shine light upon uh, the organic solar cell is that uh, the photon will be absorbed by the uh, polymer donor and you will create a, an exciton, which is a charge pair, hole and electron. Um, and this exciton will migrate to the interface between the donor and the acceptor material and we will have charge separation after which the uh, different charges will tra be transported to the respective electrodes. How is a typical organic solar cell prepared if we go to the lab? Well, size-wise, we're typically talking way below one square centimeter. Uh, rigid substrates are often used, indium tin oxide as the transparent electrodes. Um, spin coating is the typical way of uh, preparing your thin films, which means that you add an amount of uh, liquid containing uh, whatever substance you want to put on top of your substrate, but it also means a lot of waste as the excess is discarded in the process. Uh, really high performances can be uh, achieved using these methods. Uh, we're talking above 10% that has been reported, but most of the factors that I just mentioned are not scalable, which is why uh, we are more interested in how to make it large scale, and meaning we need to look upon 
uh, the whole process as a new thing. Uh, Size-wise, we're talking about square centimeters to square meters. Uh, we're talking length of kilometers of foil. And the general emphasis that we have here at DTU on how we prepare these solar cells is we need to try to make a process that could be used as a product and uh, try and solve some of the stability issues that are related to uh, the organic solar cells. For the organic solar cells to be competitive with other technologies, um, additive processing is a requirement, meaning that we don't waste any material. Uh, we need to rid the processes of use of scarce materials such as indium, so indium tin oxide as transparent electrode is not an option. And you also need to think about uh, the energy that you put into the solar cell. So keeping the temperatures down, making sure that you have a, an embodied energy in the final product that is much less uh, than conventional uh, photovoltaics. With respect to lifetime of such a technology, we would be talking about years in order to consider this as uh, success. So far, uh, efficiency-wise, uh, the organic solar cell on a larger scale is not as high as the small-scale devices. We're talking 2 to 4%. And this, of course, means that if you want to use the technology for energy production uh, on a larger scale, uh, beyond what you call gadgets, then you need relatively large areas in order to uh, achieve this. You, of course, also need a roll-to-roll -roll machine. Uh, very briefly, walking through the machine, we start down at A, where we have an unwinder. Uh, the foil leaves the roll here and starts going into the machinery. Then it comes up to B, where an edge guide align the foil. So we have the foil placed exactly the same, exactly the same position during uh, the whole process. Uh, we have the possibility to clean the web, corona treat, uh, and then we have various uh, printing and coding stations. We have an E a flexo printer. Uh, at F, we have a slot die station, oven, rotary screen printing, um, and another oven before we reach the rewinder where uh, the roll of the final uh, print is rolled in up. Um, Fabrication-wise, uh, we have other methods than the spin coating. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the flexor printing, which, which is, uh, you could say, generally a continuous stamping method, where ink is picked up uh, by a fountain roller, transferred to an analog roller, which is then, again, uh, transferred to the printing plate cylinder, which transfers it onto the moving web and you achieve the desired pattern. In rotary screen printing, the ink is put inside a screen and you have a squeegee that squeezes the ink through a mesh in, in the screen and onto the web. And finally, we have slot die coating where the ink is passed through a slot die coating head, uh, going through small slots inside the head and down to a meniscus guide with as you see in the picture, it gives you the possibility to make stripes. The two first, the flexible printing and the rotary screen printing, are 2D, 2D, 2D dim, uh, dimensional, uh, whereas the slot die coating is one dimensional. You can only coat along uh, the web. How can this be used to make uh, larger scale installations? And this is where the Infinity project, as we call it, came into place. It started out with uh, trying to make a new electrode, uh, or what we call the flextrode, which is a substitute for ITO, um, which basically consists of first the flexor printed uh, silver, then a uh, rotary screen printed uh, P dot, transparent P dot, and finally a zinc oxide layer uh, allowing for uh, charge selectivity. Because of the printed uh, character of the flex road, meaning you have silver fingers covering some of the, uh, the area, 
also the p dot is not completely transparent. Uh, the transparency of the flex chode is somewhat reduced with respect to uh, ITO, but uh, at the same time it has a really good uh, conductivity and we found it a really good choice to substitute the ITO. Okay, step two, the infinity module. Um, in order to reduce the uh, amount of current in a module on a large area, our strategy was to have instead a high voltage but serially connected module where many different, many uh, separate solar cells were working. This allows for the low current allows for uh, avoiding high current bus bars, meaning that everything can be printed or coded. Uh, and the external wiring in the resulting uh, solar cell module uh, can have a thin outline and you would end up with something that had two terminals uh, and no manual connections in the process. Um, so to go through the module, it started out with the flexor printed silver grid, as I talked about before. On top of this, it's printed a uh, rotor screen printed high conductive p-dot, then a layer of zinc oxide in order to uh, achieve electron selectivity, then the active layer, p-dot PSS for hole selectivity, and finally everything is finished off by rotor screen printing of a silver back electrode, uh, which also connects the, uh, the different cells. And you can here see a small video of how the different processing uh, goes on. This small video shows the, uh, the different steps of the infinity module fabrication. Uh, first, we start out with flexor printing of the front electrode, uh, which is silver followed by rotary screen printing of p-dot uh, where the ink is squeezed through the screen and onto the uh, silver grid. This is followed by zinc oxide slot die coating where you can see it clearly see the meniscus of the zinc oxide uh, which is coated onto the p-dot. This is followed by the active layer also processed with slot die coating this is P3HT PCBM. And finally, we have first uh, P.PSS PSS as a bag electrode, uh, which is the whole selective um, element of this, the solar cell. And this is followed by this is followed by silver screen printing uh, for the back electrode, which also make the serial leak connection. After printing, uh, and such print, print lengths could be up to 700 meters of finalized solar cell, uh, we typically took out 100 meter stretches uh, and mounted them outside. Uh, meaning we had around 21,000 serially connected solar cells, um, which uh, gives you around 10,000 volts. Efficiency-wise, we uh, achieve with such stretches around 2%, uh, which is a relatively typical uh, efficiency for a P3HT uh, module which has been rotor row processed and it has thus been possible to transfer uh, the results from the small technology to a really really large scale where 100 percent technical yield is necessary in order uh, for the big module to function stability wise uh, it showed really high stability you see at the curves down here that even after three thousand hours uh, there's an initial drop in the beginning, but after that, it's really, really stable. Um, 
and the resulting solar park here showing six stretches uh, of solar cells put up together, the equipment that was used to mount it. Uh, and here's a small video showing the actual mounting of the organic solar cell uh, onto a wooden scaffold, 100 meters long, time two and a half meters. Uh, we had a custom built wagon built and you uh, see how easily it's uh, simultaneously rolled out and uh, attached to the wooden scaffold. Uh, the whole process of inst installing 100 meters takes around one minute from one end to the other, uh, after which the, the foil is attached to the scaffold. As you can see, each scaffold can hold six uh, stretches or six modules of solar cells. Uh, and if we connect these in serials, series uh, with each of the modules being 21,000 cells we have an active area of around uh, just below 90 square meters and an output of uh, 1.3 kilowatts. Uh, energy payback times of around 180 days was achieved and lifetime wise uh, the system is still running and it's almost two years ago. Uh, so, all in all, we consider this a great success. Also, for smaller setups, we had uh, grid connections, uh, but this was for a smaller setup, as the system cannot take uh, such high voltages as we're working with here. We also wanted to do some other installation with this setup, uh, or the Infinity design, so you can cut it out in the lengths that you uh, deem necessary. So we try to go both by air and water as well and uh, the solar tubes in water worked. Uh, efficiency wise you see they're somewhat more limited uh, because the angle towards the sun is not as good uh, as you see on the scaffold uh, and also in the air uh, we had relatively good results. I would not recommend though that you uh, start sending up 10,000 or here in this case a thousand watt modules up in the air. Uh, if they detach, uh, somebody could really get hurt. One thing about this project is that it is quite dangerous and you need proper education in order to work with a system like this. Uh, we also had our share of failure modes. Uh, we had the worst one, we had lightning strike on our scaffold and as you see it resulted in serious burns of the solar cells uh, and it's very difficult to put out a fire of when you have 10,000 volts uh, and you also have the uh, electrical fa failure modes. Here you see some pictures where you uh, in the picture A you see how should be when there's no failure modes and on BDNE you can see small pinpoint holes where you can see that heat is generated. Uh, so I cannot emphasize enough that care should be taken uh, with such a setup. It is possible though to repair these and we showed several different ways of doing it. Uh, smaller scratches could be repaired simply by uh, covering the scratch with additional barrier foil and uh, polyurethane glue. Uh, the possibility of cutting out the defect area and rewiring is a, uh, another one. And if it's a larger segment, you can simply cut out and replace the segment um, um, with a new one. And this shows how versatile the technology actually is. To sum it up, we have shown that OPV can be produced uh, very fast using row to row methods. Um, and this can be done in a fully additive process where we, we avoid vacuum steps. We have prepared an electrode, the flextrode, which is, has uh, efficiencies uh, comparable to IGO in the final uh, devices. And 
it's possible to make a scalable high power system using OPV, although the efficiency is uh, not very high. The technology has uh, short energy payback time, and although the high voltage has proven really challenging, uh, if the solar cell is damaged, it can be repaired. And with this, I thank you.